Hello, I'm Rachel McTavish and welcome to COPcast, an exciting series of programmes exploring the COP26 climate conference and why it's so important. I'm delighted to be joined by Julie Sakira, Executive Director of the US Climate Alliance, Pete Ogden, Vice President for Energy, Climate and the Environment at the United Nations Foundation, Sarah Shanley Hope, Vice President, Brand and Partnerships at the Solutions Project, and Professor Elizabeth Bomberg, Deputy Director of Politics and International Relations at the University of Edinburgh. Thank you all very much for joining us. In today's programme, we'll be looking at the opportunities and barriers for America at COP26. Elizabeth, if I can turn to you first, can we start by briefly looking back at what happened to US environmental politics under Trump's administration? Yes, well, national national climate policy and international engagement under the Trump administration was uh, pretty minimal, if not completely uh, lax. We know that Trump and his administration, they are noted for uh, climate denialism, for an evisceration of climate legislation at home, disengagement from international action on climate change, most notably when Trump withdrew the US uh, from the uh, Paris uh, climate agreement. But it's important to note that even during uh, Trump, there was a lot of action going on uh, below the federal uh, level, and I'm hoping that Julie and others can say more about that. Um, nonetheless, um, even so, now with a new uh, Biden administration clearly committed to addressing uh, climate change, we now see a whole realm of different possibilities open up, and I hope we can discuss those today. Well, Julie, yes, let's go to you now. Can the US regain global credibility on climate change given its lack of global climate leadership over the last several years? I have to admit, I have been very impressed with um, what Pre President Biden has already proposed. I think the global community has had a lot of whiplash from, you know, Kyoto, from the, the numerous other agreements that we've pulled out of, and then Paris Agreement, all of which uh, had sustained U.S. leadership in order to achieve I think that the administration is credible in part because they've put forward a very bold package of actions, some of which can be done exclusively by the federal government, uh, so by President Biden. Uh, they are they are also benefiting from controlling both chambers in Congress, which means that there is actually a, a pathway for putting in place um, some some uh, laws that will actually continue climate action beyond uh, next the next administration and through the stimulus are looking at how they can actually invest in a very bold infrastructure and jobs package that at its core is really a climate package. And then I think the other thing I would layer on that is our coalition of states. You have a coalition of mayors who in the United States have tremendous authority when it comes to actually putting in place climate policies. And so at a minimum, those groups are going to be backstopping the administration and by working hand in hand with them. There's also the opportunity for them to be even bolder than what the administration is proposing and to really lock in that progress so that we're able to buffer against major changes at the federal level going forward. Uh, Pete, what will the United Nations do to support this new administration? Well, I think what's what I think what the the Biden administration has is a is a great partner in the UN. The the kind of um, the way that the Secretary General for the past four or five years now has been talking about this challenge. It's been about raising ambition. It's about cutting fossil fuel subsidies. It's uh, about mobilizing the necessary climate finance and about really building back better globally after COVID. And now those are very, very consistent with the kind of framing and, consi uh, uh, and commitments that the Biden administration uh, is adopting. So I think they can take a lot of what, what the Biden administration is trying to do nationally and help to really internationalize it. Uh, Sarah, the Biden administration has proposed bold infrastructure plans packed full of climate initiatives. We'll touch on that infrastructure plan a little later. But uh, the Solutions Project is all about that, isn't it? Finding solutions to the challenges that communities face. What do you think are the primary uh, domestic hurdles to the climate ambitions? Can they be overcome? Yes, I mean, absolutely. The Solutions Project really invests in frontline 
communities, which are those communities of color largely uh, that are experiencing the worst harms of the climate crisis, of the dirty energy economy and pollution that got us here. Um, and so it's interesting building on what Julie was sharing those communities at the front lines of the crisis haven't stopped um, because of federal inaction. So a lot of progress has been made on really powerful and scalable solutions. Um, New York State, for example, uh, frontline organizations really led um, the strongest uh, climate policy in the country and, and won that, including not only 100% commitment to clean energy, but also a 35 to 40 percent investment target for environmental justice communities. And that really inspired the Biden-Harris administration's Justice 40 initiative, which is key to the infrastructure vision and really ensuring that climate action benefits um, the most marginalized communities with health outcomes, job creation, you know, creating the future that we all want. Uh, Julie, we've got some new key appointments as well. People with very strong climate records. We've got the new National Climate Advisor and, of course, John Kerry, as well as that first special presidential envoy uh, for climate. What sort of a difference will that make to taking things forward? Oh, I think it's huge. And I, I should say in the in the past, I actually worked with the Obama administration at the State Department and this is the first time that we've really had a whole of government approach, which is I think exactly what you need if what you're talking about is transforming your economy to get onto a one and a half degree pathway. And so you're you're basically taking these two heavyweights, so Gina McCarthy on the domestic side, John Kerry on the international side. Gina is really going to be able to pull together all the different agencies to have this very comprehensive approach. And then you've got Jen, John Kerry, who as Secretary of State, has relationships at the highest levels of government. And so I think it's been a real signal from the Biden administration that climate is, in fact, a bedrock priority for the administration. Pete, what was your um, view when you heard about the appointment to, of John Kerry? He's on his way to Shanghai as we speak. Uh, it, are, you, are you happy about that development? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think I think while they've certainly the Biden administration has has, as Julie mentioned, pursuit an all of government approach, having the international effort, the international face of that be somebody who has such credibility uh, and as a senior statesman, um, I think is really important. And also because part of a whole of government mean, means across your foreign policy too. And I think, you know, often you have people who, who understand foreign policy issues, then you have separate group of people who are really specialists in the kind of the intricacies of climate diplomacy. And, you know, to get a former secretary of state who has had to balance those and balance them, I think, quite effectively uh, uh, in the run up and at the Paris uh, COP uh, five and a half years ago, um, I think he's, he's certainly the right person for that task. Let's examine this new infrastructure bill then, because that's what everybody's talking about. The Economist is calling it a climate gamble, a two trillion dollar bill, which Biden is saying is investing in the future of America. Elizabeth, do you see it as a move towards tackling uh, the climate crisis or or is it just about um, building bridges literally in America? Yeah, it's probably one of the most significant moves in the U.S., to address the uh, climate uh, crisis. This uh, infrastructure bill does indeed uh, provide for things like bridge building and even road building, but even in those traditional forms of infrastructure, there's a climate element in that there is clear guidance about the kinds of materials we want might want to use for that. But much more than that, that infrastructure bill is infused with uh, climate directed um, measures in terms of retraining, in terms of retrofitting, in terms of course, um, uh, clean energy and research and uh, development. And what really matters, and the other um, speakers here have already indicated that, is that under this administration, it's not just about addressing climate, that climate is inextricably linked 
to recovery, to uh, addressing inequalities, uh, to um, recovery, to even um, uh, competition with um, other countries. So uh, yes, it's a uh, it, it it is a gamble in its size and scope, but it is one well worth taking. Sarah, what response have you seen at grassroots level from the communities that you've been working with? Yeah, I mean, in frontline communities, this is not a gamble. It's actually just a down payment. Um, you know, the, the opportunities for investment, especially from the public sector, are so much greater even than this, you know, big T uh, infrastructure bill. Um, you know, what we're seeing across the country, and it's really different places. It's not just coastal United States. It's looking in Iowa at the rural electric cooperatives um, that are democratizing and, and transitioning to clean energy. It's um, water infrastructure. I mean, we're coming off of, you know, a, a just breakdown in our water and energy infrastructure throughout the South, not just in Texas, um, but in Mississippi, and you're seeing um, community organizations and, and frontline communities have generational experience um, in terms of, of meeting their own needs, solving their own problems. And so you've got these solutions. Um, one of our grantee partners uh, has just installed the regions, the, the southern of the United States region, um, first hydro panel installation, which literally uh, creates fresh, clean drinking water from thin air through um, solar technology um, and, and transforming water vapor into drinkable water. And this is a, you know, historic black church in, uh, you know, Florence, South Carolina, that's, that's innovating in these ways. And, and so just the opportunity for scale for the federal government to recognize some of these innovations that are happening out of necessity and out of a, a, a place and experience of survival at the intersection of housing, you know, safe and clean drinking water, um, you know, job and economic growth in communities that have been so severely underinvested in for years, for decades, um, through redlining and other um, unjust policies in this country. There's just a tremendous uh, moment of hope and excitement and clarity that this is just the first step. Pete, there is that desperate need, though, for support for retraining because green jobs are, are going to be needed in renewables. Coal mining, though, remains a huge factor in 25 states in the US, and that's likely to be replaced by renewables in 2033. So you need to see that transition for retraining. Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely right. And that's and that's not only true in the United States. In fact, it's even more true in, in many other parts of the world where economies have been historically linked to, to coal production. But those same communities have also, as a result of that, uh, borne a lot of cost, health costs. Uh, uh, we just heard about some of the of water pollution issues. So I think fortunately, and I think this is something that the Biden administration has been clear about from the beginning, which is you need to, you need to help to build that alternative economic path for this to be sustainable. And I think actually to take this back to the point at the beginning, Julie was making about you know the the sometimes the feeling of whiplash that the commu international community might have from the United States swinging from where President Obama was to President Trump to President Biden. You know the I think the infrastructure bill in particular is really a way to anchor this clean energy sustainable economic vision in a way that will be deep and really difficult to undo. I mean, short of self-sabotage by a future administration, you know, you, if you're, you're not gonna undo the clean energy infrastructure that you've built. I mean, you know, and that's, that's sort of one of the things that got us through the last four years, frankly, is that there was, it wasn't as though at the end of the day, even though the federal government was not interested in promoting clean energy, innovation kept happening mm -hmm. you know, in states that cared about this issue, it kept happening. The state of California has been at the forefront of climate action in our country. Nobody is running there trying to, to slow down its economic growth by proposing that it that it sort of reverse course and stop embracing this kind of uh, this, this future. So I actually think that's where really one of the biggest opportunities uh, lies.
Sarah, are there any points that you want to to pick up on there? You are nodding away. Yes, I mean, that's exactly right. Um, our partners uh, on the ground in California, as one example, you know, in, in many ways, the the um, lack of competency <laughs> at the federal level during the Trump <laughs> regime pushed us even further. There was subnational leadership, of course, that we saw on the international stage and here on the ground in California, and, and I'm here in Oakland, California, um, you know, it, it, organizations that have been leading this transition for decades did not stop. They, in fact, accelerated um, during the last four years because the need was so great and um, you do have leadership at the local level and increasingly it's it's nonpartisan. It crosses, um, you know, in the United States, the, the language of red, blue and, and purple districts. Um, everybody wants affordable, healthy, clean energy. The, the polling is really strong. The concrete examples, um, and in fact, we need a new metaphor. Concrete is, is not the specific <laughs> examples. Um, all across the country um, of, you know, clean, renewable energy, um, you know, stormwater management uh, and, and land management practices that are inspired by um, indigenous and First Nations legacy um, caretaking of the land and stewarding of the land, um, you know, thinking about our local food systems. And, and I think this is, this is a growing international trend as well, where you're actually seeing the benefits in your day-to-day -day lives of these solutions. And, you know, government actually is, is needing to catch up to the innovations and the the solutions that are being put into practice um, in communities by small businesses at the local level. Elizabeth, the all important question, is this bill going to get passed? Hmm. Um, possibly, uh, yes. If it does get passed, it will be passed not as a piece of uh, legislation, congressional legislation. It will be passed um, as a budgetary bill, something called um, budget uh, reconciliation. So that has some real advantages in this case and has some disadvantages. The advantages is that um, as a budget uh, uh, measure, it only needs a simple majority uh, in, in Congress. Um, so the because the Democrats, Biden's party has a very thin, uh, but a, a majority in both houses, um, provided that he can get all the Democrats in the Senate on board, uh, then um, with the help of uh, Vice President Kamala Harris casting a, the tie-breaking vote in the Senate, it can um, it, it, this can get through. The the, one of my hesitations, and maybe why I'm not quite as optimistic as some of our speakers, and is that um, when action is taken, such as through budgetary measures like this or through executive action, which has been the form that Biden has used for virtually all these um, bold measures thus far, um, they uh, can be more easily um, undone. So Pete, you made a really good point about if the infrastructure bill is passed, once that clean infrastructure starts, then it would be very difficult to undo. And that is the case to a certain um, extent, um, but there might be a lot of these measures that can be uh, pulled back. So what we need to look out for is um, what, kind of, um, what kind of support is there once these measures take root? Um, because if there is public support, if there's support um, elsewhere in Congress, at the state level, amongst citizens, then even though you might get partisan backlash, that can be um, minimized. Um, but I'd still like to see, if I, I would still like to see a much more uh, congressional legislation so it would be great if we can get a bit more bipartisanship for any of these measures, which we really have not seen yet.
Uh, Julie, during the Trump admin, um, federal action was stymied, but action from states was really forging ahead. Do you think this sub-state momentum is going to continue under Biden? I do. And, and we're really looking at it as an opportunity for a paradigm shift in the way that states and the federal government engage. And so historically, the federal government has, you know, with consultation, uh, developed policies that are then um, sort of handed off to states to to implement in some way. And the Biden administration is coming in where states have states and local governments have thousands of policies on the books already. And so we need to be careful about how we overlay federal and local and state policies to make sure that they're effective. Um, I think with a new type of relationship, the benefit that we see is, you know, states are innovators. And so if we're looking at testing that, you know, those cutting edge policy states are great partners to figure out what works so that the federal government can mm -hmm. figure out how to scale it up. Our states also represent 60% of the US economy. And so where we can harmonize policies like procurement practices, it also creates the opportunity for us to really move not just a national market, but global markets um, in a direction that hopefully puts us on the irreversible paths that you know Pete is talking about that we've seen in clean energy, but that we still need to achieve on things like clean vehicles. And I would say the other thing is, if we have a federal government that provides the new floor, it allows our states to build on federal policy and actually be more ambitious. And that makes it more likely that we'll achieve what hopefully next week is a very bold NDC. Um, and it means that those policies are going to be more durable, more ambitious in the long term. So I do think that even with the new administration, states and local governments actually have an even more critical role to play if the Biden administration has any chance at all at meeting the goals that they've set for themselves. Uh, aside from this bill, what else needs to be done, Pete, to overcome that partisan divide on climate and global engagement? What do you think? <laughs> well, it's a good question. I guess I was going to add just one quick point on the, on, the, uh -huh. on the two previous comments, Elizabeth and Julie's, which were great. I think they both pointed to different ways to create that sort of base support upon which the kind of the forward actors can build, whether it's legislative, where there's some kind of durable basis that gives 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 actors the confidence to, mm -hmm. to, to really push ahead. Julie, I think, was talking a lot, really looking through the lens of the U.S. Climate Alliance, which is the kind of subnational political organization, right? How do you set and define a political vision for your state? And I think the third one to also look at, which has really changed in the last four years, is the private sector. I mean, you have the private sector has set goals mm -hmm. for itself that exceed anything certainly that the Trump administration was going to ask them to do, but that really are never going to be the baseline of any future policy because they've gone so far ahead. I mean, you have GM in the United States going out ahead and saying they're going to only be selling electric vehicles by 2035. You have Microsoft and Apple, right? The titans of our of our tech industry saying that they're going to go to carbon, new, carbon negative and carbon neutral respectively by 2030. So though they they are to give to achieve those goals, they need partners in the United States, and I think and in, in the federal government, rather than seeing it the other way around as, as somebody that that's going to be imposing um, you know further regulatory burdens on them. Um, and and to your last question, I think the bipartisan support, I think um, is I think there's a generational shift underway. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it, it's much more partisan the further you go up towards federal government. I think the, the most partisan right now, it's the federal level. Um, and I think frankly, that the more that we are able to tie and demonstrate the case for clean economic growth being something that is, has lots of co-benefits for citizens, uh, uh, I think that, that you're, you're, again, I think it's gonna become in everyone's political interest to, 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 to get on board. Elizabeth, that we are still in movement, which Pete was referring to, that joint declaration of support for climate action signed by more than uh, three and a half thousand CEOs, mayors, governors, colleges, etc. That really gained momentum, didn't it? And that hasn't gone away no matter no matter what happened during the, the Trump administration. Yeah, and that's what's so exciting in this new era, because we even under the Trump administration, there was so much going on, um, as uh, as we've just heard from Pete and Julie and Sarah and the others. Okay, but 
to think of what can be done beyond that once we get leadership uh, from the top sending very clear signals that um, yes, I hear that, uh, I hear what you're saying, that climate is important. And again, that we can address climate and then address many of the other issues facing the US um, at, at, um, at, at the same time. So provided that message can continue uh, and provided that it can't be um, sabotaged, uh, then we are on very strong grounds. Uh, Julie, there is that difficulty, though, isn't there, navigating the new green rules and also balancing that out with a post-COVID-19 economy, trying to get that economy back on track? Oh, and that's been so challenging for our states. I mean, they're seeing some of the biggest budget deficits that they've ever seen in their history. So massive revenue losses that are impacting government operations. They're having to furlough staff. And so um, the recovery is going to be essential and getting a very strong stimulus package that flows down to states. And so I think one of the focuses going forward is going to be working very closely with the federal government to make sure that those resources are both helping states and, and local governments recover from both the health and the economic crisis. They're really focused on helping their communities um, and helping them get back on their feet, but then making sure that those investments are also helping them to meet their climate goals. And so we need to have a robust dialogue with the White House and also Congress to make sure that we're fixing the problems that have existed historically and, and how those mm -hmm. funds are allocated. And so, you know, just one thing in thinking about the infrastructure package, um, for example, is, you know, his usually recovery resources um, are invest or the stimulus is invested in shovel ready projects. But many of those projects that are shovel ready are from years ago that have been planned for a long time and don't necessarily align with their climate goals. Right. So a lot of this is actually changing the definition for what a shovel project ready is and making sure it's inclusive of planning stages. So there's a lot of work like that that I think needs to be done right now to make sure that when those resources finally hopefully come out from Congress, that they can actually be allocated and used in such a way that it really is both achieving our goals to recover from the sort of triple health, climate and economic crises that the, the, the U.S. is currently facing. Yes, Sarah, go on so glad that these points have been raised because this is exactly what we're seeing and continue to see in the innovations that are created by frontline communities so in the last year you know dozens of our grantee partners that are on the ground in you know the intersections of all these issues yes covid yes um you know extreme unemployment as, as the result of a global pandemic um, police brutality and um, the racial reckoning across the United States, all of these issues, including climate, are intersecting in the same communities, typically, you know, Black, Indigenous, Asian Pacific, um, Islander, immigrant communities of color, other communities of color. And so they are solving those interconnected problems with interconnected solutions. And, and that's exactly right. We're learning from um, some of the hard lessons uh, from the Obama administration, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, um, many of the issues that were already raised here today were from that decade ago, um, where local government agencies and community organizations were, were really caught flat-footed in terms of our readiness to draw down those resources and put them to work in ways that improve people's lives, yes, through climate solutions, but having those solutions play out in affordable housing, in good job creation, in small business development, in um, you know resiliency and, and water and land management practices practices that really restore um, our, our environmental health, but also our human health in the same breath. And so today, you know, there is a different day. There are incredible um, examples of, you know, local government infrastructure and agencies, um, you know, mayor's offices, of course, um, you know, community organizations, um, community development corporations, so different levels of um, like, you know, financing institutions that are accountable to neighbors in that community. And it's it's nascent. The, the pieces need to be um, put together for that puzzle to be 
really robust and um, successful all across the country, but we are in such a stronger position now in, in this moment with this administration based on those lessons learned. And I think community coming together with government, um, with the private sector, uh, in addition um, to just the incredible um, scientific research and, and economic research that guides us today to do things differently is, is exciting. Elizabeth, do you think climate justice is high enough up on the agenda? Yeah, it was really striking listening to what Julie and Sarah just said. I think there's some uh, key parallels that we can draw between uh, what's going on within the U.S. and what can go on uh, globally. So by that, I mean, what sort of leadership can the U.S. then show at the global stage when it comes to uh, addressing global inequities and global uh, in injustices. So here, I, what I really like to see, and hopefully we will see some of this in Glasgow, is about leadership from the US, not just about lowering um, um, emissions, but helping others to do that as uh, well. So delivering funding uh, for developing uh, countries to cut their own emissions and to uh, adapt to the severely, uh, increasingly severe climate impacts. So I'm hoping that this, this dynamic that we've just described going on within the U.S. can in a way almost be scaled up and, and replicated uh, at, uh, at, at, the, uh, at the Glasgow summit as well. Pete, we've got uh, Biden inviting 40 world leaders to the Leaders Summit on Climate next week, designed to underscore the urgency of the climate crisis. What do you think he can do to urge other countries to match US ambition? Well, I think the first step is to set US ambition. And I think that the, the forthcoming 2030 target that he committed to, to unveiling by the time of the summit is going to be the defining moment, really. Uh, I know that they've done an amazing amount of work to try to go around the world and try to urge other countries to up their ambition. But, you know, it's the United States is the one country that left the Paris Agreement. And I think that they've done a really good job, this administration, of recognizing that to get back in, it's not just signing, you know, signing on the dotted line. It's showing that you, you're, you're prepared to do what it takes to realizing that goal. And really, you know, while I know it gets a lot of attention about, you know, this is the Biden summit, but, you know, President Biden's not, and their administration isn't pushing for anything that isn't already part of the UK's vision for Glasgow, that isn't consistent with the Paris Agreement, that isn't where the Secretary General hasn't been pointing towards for the last four years. So I think this is really about the US, you know, getting back involved, showing, leading where it can, and being part of that broader effort. And I think Elizabeth makes a great point, a big piece of that, and I don't expect it all to get resolved between now and you know April twenty second is how how to how to project other kinds of leadership once you've kind of got your domestic base uh, uh, more in order. What what do you see, Pete, about that relationship between uh, the the U.S. and the China collaboration? How do you see that working? We'll find out. <laughs> I think that's a big. <laughs> that's obviously been a huge challenge. I mean, you know, we during the you know and during the Obama administration when things were thought to be quite tense, it's all relative, I suppose, between the US and China. We nevertheless, in that environment, managed to pull together and come together very much in a bilateral way to help really drive agreement uh, around Paris. So, you know, it was possible in those times. It was done by Secretary Kerry then, led by, I think, so there's, you know, there's muscle memory in the system about how to do cooperation. China's appointed as its counter counterpart to, to Secretary Kerry, the same person who held that post in the run up to uh, in the run up to uh, So I you know I think the potential is there, but they're gonna have a lot of other a really much more complicated relationship. Um, Julie sorry, Julie, what is do you think are some of the most important alliance partnerships for the US? Where where, where can they where can they uh, regalvanize the global climate action? Well, I do think China is going to be one of the big outliers. I think there's a lot of potential with 
with India, for example, as sort of a counterweight in some ways to China. The EU, the UK, um, Canada in particular, and hopefully Mexico, I think also would be partners. We've always had a really strong relationship in North America under the Obama administration really used the North America Leader Summit as a way to demonstrate regional leadership. And so I think that could certainly be strengthened by bringing the Mexicans along. Um, and then, of course, I think with all of the U.S. subnationals that have been carrying the water for the last four years, many of them have been leaders for the last 40. And so I don't think that has to be limited to just states. But if the U.S. can show up at COP with you know, flanked by governors, mayors, CEOs to show that we have an all of society approach to how we're going to really enshrine climate as a priority for the United States going forward. I think that that domestic alliance is actually going to help with the international alliances that we have and really just be a show of four at COP26. Uh Elizabeth, what do you what do you think about this uh, World Leaders Summit next week? How do you think other countries will be reacting to to Biden suddenly taking centre stage again? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I think it's a bit double edged, um, and I would just follow on from what Julie was saying about summits. And summits are uh, in in international relations. We often talk about. Um, summits is theater so summits um are there to make deals but they're also very much about uh, the ability to um uh, assert your nation's um, position and culture and often they're about playing to the audience back home as well so i think that we're seeing both those elements or we'll see both those elements next week in the leaders climate summit so uh, what that means is that for instance um with uh, 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 india and china there's already been some uh, at least bemusement or maybe some, if not resentment, about the U.S. trying to push them to announce their own targets or uh, kick up their game. And they uh, and they look at the U.S. and just put up with four years of the U.S. Uh, trying to uh, destruct what we're doing. Um, and what this means is that it will be more important for the U.S. to build up that trust and credibility. And Julie's given a, a really good way to do that. You come with a, a full flanks of everyone underneath the federal uh, level that's been helping you to shore up that credibility. But the, um, the final thing I want to say on that is that it works the other way as well in that it's very possible that um, China, for instance, won't want to uh, announce anything significant at the American summit, it, um, even if it has something, it will wait and then there might, it will probably uh, make its own announcement even just a couple days later in its own terms and it's on and, and, uh, and on its own uh, uh, turf. So we might not see necessarily next week all the uh, all the grand pronouncements, but that doesn't mean that work hasn't been done on them. Well, let's take a look now at what we'd like to see uh, the US accomplish at Glasgow at COP26. Sarah, what are you really hoping for? I mean, I think it is um, naming really clearly the intersections of of all of um, these issues. Um, the UN has obviously made incredible commitments around sustainability uh, development goals that, that really cross issues and understand climate as a whole systems change, um, not only about measuring CO2, but, but really about, you know, women and girls education and about um, human rights and housing and health and, and all of the um, ways that uh, a healthy, stable climate can actually restore um, a good life, you know, for, for all people. And so, you know, I think from um, past cops, it, it's like when there is that ground up interconnection across sectors, not just corporate and industry leaders along with government and subnational leaders, but including community innovation and, and community leadership, there's there's transformation, you know, 100% clean energy rose in Paris, because that was a common um, goal 
that was expressed across every sector. And it came from, um, you know, a lot of work happening and relationships happening um, across many years that came to that moment. So I'm hoping there's a similar kind of groundswell of, um, yeah, a much fuller picture of the transformation and the meaning in people's day-to-day lives that bold climate action um, can achieve. Pete, what do you see as the main differences in the US position at this COP compared to, to past summits? Well, it's interesting because, you know, back during, you know, President Obama's era, when we were still trying to be constructive in COPs and advance the climate agenda, we were largely in the midst of a negotiation, right? I mean, it was about actually trying to define, at the end of the day, an agreement. Now, this administration comes in, we have the agreement. And thankfully, it withstood four years of the U.S. not being very committed to it uh, and finally leaving it at the very tail end very briefly. Um, but it, it did withstand it. And so we don't go into this COP where the most important things are what gets you know, hammered out at 4 a.m. on the last night between governments with backroom dealings. I mean, you can't build your clean energy economy <laughs> overnight or negotiate it at three in the morning. That, the work is gonna be something that, that's gonna to have to happen over the course of this year. And I think hopefully what we do is we get, by the time we get to Glasgow, we will be in a position where we can look, feel like we're consolidating the accomplishments of the past year and have a clear path of how to quickly get from, I mean, if we're point A now and that's point B, how do we quickly get to point C? Julie, what are you hoping to see achieved at COP26 in Glasgow? Well, I'm hoping that we're finally really focused on implementation in a in a big way. And so, you know, aside from obviously wanting to to showcase the leadership of a lot of our subnational governments, like our our governors and how they've you know con continued to lead the charge, I think it's really about getting past the negotiations and working with other countries as partners in the transformation of the global economy. We've made a lot of progress in clean energy, but there's a lot left to do. But there's also sectors that continue to be major emitters where we haven't had a lot of progress, like on transportation, on heavy industry. And so now is the time for us to going into the COP show that we've put those policies in place. We actually have hopefully through the stimulus, put some money on the table actually for the U.S. to be actually taking action and leading. And so we're going into that with our pathway for how we get there, the money to do it, the policies to do it, and then talking to other countries about the global transformation that is needed for us to get to a one and a half degree trajectory. And that means that people are going to really need to rethink sectors of their economy and figure out how we can together entirely move those sectors. And so I'm, I'm hoping that at a minimum, COP26 is really the first big serious conversation on how we get to that transformation. Do you think it um, has been hugely damaging the fact that we didn't have it last November? I don't in part because I have to be honest, I mean, with the U.S. being in, in, a, in an election transition, I actually think it probably to some degree was a relief that, that, that it didn't happen. It gives us a whole nother year to plan. It gives the administration time to like demonstrate that they're really in this for real and to do the legwork that they're so good at doing in sort of rallying other countries to get to a place where they're ready to make commitments. And, and so I think in some ways we've benefited by having that extra year. Uh, what are your thoughts, Elizabeth? Uh, yes, on that last point, I think it, I think the postponement worked in not just the U.S.'s, but it worked in the uh, globe's uh, favor because we have uh, such a different type of uh, leader from the U.S. Uh, going in. However, I would would not want to see a further postponement for uh, Bor who. who was uh, key to the earlier uh, negotiations that suggested maybe that's what we need to do. I'm, I'm hoping that we don't postpone further, that we go further, that, that we go ahead to Glasgow because um, we've just discussed here about how the leadership that the U.S has the ability to play and can play. I'd like to see that really come to fruition. I'd like to see much more in terms of um, uh, green debt relief. So this point we're making earlier about linking uh, uh, justice 
and uh, climate globally, as well as uh, within the U.S. And then my final um, uh, wish sounds really uh, silly in a way, but um, I, I would like us to leave with something uh, quite uh, uh, quite uh, uh, tangible, something uh, specific. Uh, the UK presidency has some very broad goals about what it wants to achieve, but I'm wondering, it wouldn't it be nice if, if there were some sort of uh, 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 takeaway, something, uh, you know, a commitment. What I'd like to see is a commitment to stop overseas coal financing internationally or something specific that you walk away with. Uh, it can be ambitious, can be doable and comprehensible, not just to the leaders, uh, but to the uh, citizens uh, back home. So fingers crossed, I hope it goes ahead. And not only because I've signed up to be a volunteer in Glasgow next November. <laughs> <laughs> so from a purely selfish point of view as well, Elizabeth. Well, that's uh, all we've got time for now. Uh, Julie, Sarah, Pete and Elizabeth, thank you all for joining us on today's COPcast. Um, remember, there's a whole host of other programmes in the COPcast series, so keep a close eye on our social media pages at Search for COP26Cast, brought to you in association with the University of Edinburgh Business School. Many thanks to all of our guests today and to you for joining us. Thank you very much. Goodbye.